I refuse to devote any more time than is necessary to talking about this stupid show is a thing that I said when I first recorded this video, but my audio had other plans. I'm so glad I went on a rant no one will ever hear. So I guess I'm just gonna have to do it all over again. You'd think it'd be difficult, but no, because now I'm hangry. They really tripled down on the atrocity this season, didn't they? The fashion, horrendous. Camille's character, totally assassinated. Black women, non-existent after three seasons. Are you kidding me? The show is supposed to be escapism, but for who? Hello friends and welcome back to my channel. It is so nice to see you. You know I love when you visit. I do wish it was under better circumstances this time though because what the- <laughs> There are several amazing YouTubers that have already posted videos with their hot takes on Emily in Paris and while I encourage you to watch all of those videos because they're amazing, I especially love hearing about the show from actual French people. I decided to go ahead and make my own video, one because I was angry and annoyed and I wanted to vent to people that would care to listen. And hopefully that's all of you. At the time of me filming this video, I have almost 100 subscribers. I'm so close, that's amazing. So thank you so much for subscribing and hopefully you care about my opinion on shows that are this dumb. Hi. And my hope is that I can contribute yet another new take to the conversation. Watch each video, get a different perspective, and you learn something new. Or maybe you don't, but you're still entertained. Why do we watch this show? I have a theory. Follow me here. It's nostalgia, right Colton? I feel like the show relies on nostalgia, our collective nostalgia for shows and films that were actually good and that Darren Starr knows that we really loved. Specifically, I'm talking about the TV show Mad Men and the movie The Devil Wears Prada. Arguably, Darren Starr just took a little from column A and a little from column B to give us Emily in Paris. But while Emily Cooper is certainly no Don Draper, I think it's fair to assume that Sylvie is our modern stand-in for Miranda Priestley. And we love her for it. It's totally worth we're it. We're here, we're hooked, we want a Sylvie spinoff, we're ready. Now, again, this could be pure coincidence. Don't ruin, don't ruin the, with your nails. No, just get, ruin my pants if you're gonna ruin anything. This armchair is vintage. Oh, so is my cape. Um, Stay Say hello to everyone, Colton. Okay, great. Now, this could just be pure coincidence, and you'll forgive me if this is a bit of a reach here, but follow me on this one. I have a theory that even her name tries to tie these two things together. Her name is Emily Cooper. Emily, as in the character of Emily Charlton, played by Emily Blunt on The Devil Wears Prada, and Cooper, taken for the name of the ad agency on Mad Men, Sterling Cooper, and later Sterling Cooper Draper And Price. also therefore taken from one of the founding partners, Bertram Cooper, who himself is a bit of an eccentric that loves argyle and bow ties and hates wearing shoes indoors. Now I get taking your shoes off at home. Uh, we do it here because we have wall-to-wall -wall carpeting, but my guy, you work here. The fashion on the show is like, if cringe was a fashion aesthetic. Cringe core. It's a lot of designers, but it's also a lot of bad and bad on purpose. Honestly, it feels like they're trolling us now. It feels like they're trolling us at this point, right? Like they took all of the criticism that we gave them and they were just like, all right, let's triple down and just make it that much Where worse. Where is the growth? Where is the character development? You know what growth isn't? Cutting your bangs, learning a little bit more French. That's not growth. You know what growth is? Growth is that Peggy scene. The last time we see Peggy, is a callback to the very first time we're introduced to Peggy. She has come full circle and her hair and her wardrobe and her attitude overall reflect that. We don't see that growth in these characters, do we? Emily is like an American that is like trying to get French fashion, but never fully gets there. Right? It almost feels like instead of Paris rubbing off on Emily, Emily is rubbing off on everyone else. Shouldn't it be the opposite? Shouldn't Emily be starting to dress better and more Parisian? And I guess in some ways, again, she it does look like she's trying. Arguably, the fashion on the show is one of the biggest draws for everyone, myself included. I don't always love it. I don't always hate it, but I do always find it interesting. Some of those outfits are definite, um, choices. The choice to use lots of bold colors and prints is 
very deliberately eye-popping, and it's what makes what you see on the screen that much more interesting. The clothes are crazy, but sometimes you wanna keep looking because the screen is full of literal eye candy, as in candy-colored clothes. The problem, though, is just how bad the fashion can often be. And I understand that fashion is subjective, and I also am pro individual style. The problem with the show is that it doesn't always feel that way. Something about the styling and the pieces on the show feel very contrived. And I feel like they don't always truly reflect the person behind them. Sylvie aside, as Sylvie continues to slay, in fact, this season was like, Sylvie in Paris. More than anything. Also, why are Camille and Emily and Mindy all wearing Louis Vuitton bags? And as much as I love seeing them on the show, do all French women own Scaparelli pieces? Do you see what I'm talking about? This isn't to say that people with uh, widely varying aesthetics can't all enjoy pieces or collections from the same designer. Sometimes different collections just hit people differently, but I do feel that when it comes to differentiating your characters on a show and using your wardrobe to illustrate that, that when it comes to costume design and or styling, this just feels kind of lazy. You could have easily designated one or even a handful of different designers to each character to help differentiate their style and their personal preferences a little more. Now, Patricia Field is usually credited as being the costume designer on this show, and we know her from her previous work with Darren Starr on Sex and the City. But for season three, it was all Marilyn Fatusi. Patricia Field mostly just serves as a consulting costume designer but we can see her and Darren's influence in the show. Like how Darren doesn't want women wearing sneakers in his world. Marilyn Fatusi had originally designed Mindy as wearing sneakers and Darren hated the idea. And both Darren and Patricia pushed Marilyn to go full crazy. This is a fantasy, go big, but also don't put women in sneakers. We can't depict people as wearing realistic fashion, but something about that feels weird because even though the show is a fantasy and the show is escapism, shouldn't you still be trying to write actual humans? And isn't a part of that the way actual humans wear their clothing? Marilyn Fatusi had mentioned in an interview that she feels that she purposely wanted to go big and to exaggerate a lot of styles, a lot of pieces, and made those really deliberate choices to go big and go crazy because often chic fashion, good fashion, can be boring. And to some extent, I can see that. I mean, given a choice between to fashion shows, which one do you think is gonna be more fun, more interesting? A Tom Ford show or a Jeremy Scott Moschino show? You know which one is gonna deliver on bright, fun, eccentric looks and colors and concepts. But at the same time, maybe if the show was, you know, well-written, you wouldn't need to rely on your characters making some really out there sartorial choices to keep people drawn I in. I feel like there are some very obvious flaws here, however, or I guess not that obvious since the writers at Emily in Paris themselves aren't aware of them. Especially when you consider how much worse Emily and Madeline's fashion choices are to everyone else. And that is where they're from. You see, the American arm of Savoie is based in Chicago. Rather than excuse the fashion as being purposefully fantastical and over the top, if we were to just take the fashion at face value, i.e. these were just people we saw walking down the street in Paris, then what Patricia Field and Darren Starr and Marilyn Fatusi have inadvertently done is just tell the world that this is what ignorant people from Chicago think fashion is. And Call me biased because I'm a New Yorker, but in a way, I guess that makes the ridiculousness of the fashion even more believable because if Emily and Madeline had come from a fashion capital like New York City, they would know and dress better. The other issue is that while I can get how good fashion can be boring, especially when you look at some of the more popular aesthetic trends, then again, 
the pendulum is always swinging. So one day we're into this crazy trend, the coconut girl. And then the next we're into this boring trend, that girl. But the idea of being chic and fashionable also be, being synonymous with dull and boring is just not true across the board. Fashion can be beautiful, chic, and tasteful, and elegant, and still be fun and cool and edgy and interesting, even youthful. To illustrate both of these points, we need to exit Netflix and go over to Hulu, where we can look no further than Selena Gomez's character of Mabel on Only Murders in the Building. One of my favorite shows personally, because you know, it's good, like actually. You see, Mabel is a New Yorker living in New York and her wardrobe is goals. It's all those things. It's youthful, it's chic, it's fun, it's interesting, while still being realistic. Realistic as in Mabel re-wears pieces throughout the series. I too am in possession of the wardrobe staple that is the black turtleneck. Honestly, where is Emily keeping all those coats? You share a tiny ass apartment with a roommate. What even is closet space? And I think that's another thing that bothers me about Emily in Paris. This idea of like wearing different outfits every time you see these characters on screen. You're not writing humans. That's not human to me because I myself own tons of coats and jackets. I love outerwear. I have lots of it. I will throw up a picture or video of me here showing off my coat collection. But even so, I will still default to the same either black coat or army green coat that I absolutely love. Why? Because real people have favorite pieces that they like re-wearing and we never see that on the show. Hot Lamode did a video on the series and somebody in the comments section also pointed out something about Emily in Paris that bothers me. For all of the fabulous and not so fabulous and truly outrageous fashion on the show, we never actually hear the characters talking about fashion to We each never other. even get the random passerby complimenting one person or the other on their fashion. Is that a Paris thing? It's almost as if the characters themselves don't even like what they're wearing half the time. My husband and I get complimented everywhere we go every time we dress up, which is most times. We talk about fashion all the time to each other, to our friends, and then we get people stopping us on the street or in the elevator telling us how great we look. Even on Only Murders in the Building, Mabel's jacket gets complimented. By the way, I'm actually really grateful to Gabriel's character for one, being the palate cleanser on screen that we all desperately need. Oh look, a t-shirt. And being our excuse to constantly show us fabulous food. Honestly, the food shots on the show are way better than the fashion, in my opinion. <laughs> I love the celebration and showing off of French food. But do you see what a crazy difference that is? Then again, one show did get 17 Emmy nominations so far, including one for best costume design for Dana Covarrubias, for only murders in the building. While the other show got, let me check my notes here, uh, two. After an epic scandal that almost took down the entire Hollywood Foreign Press Association. After it was discovered that more than 30 Golden Globe voters were flown to Paris, all expenses paid, and wined and dined in an effort to bribe their way to two Golden Globe nominations. And later, two Emmys. At least no one on the Gryffindor team had to buy their way in. They got in on pure talent. Also a fun little interesting difference if you're interested. The choice to pull references from the 60s for Emily's character. And you can see some of that influence in a lot of the pieces that were chosen. A change triggered by the cutting of trauma bangs, no doubt. Whereas Mabel is a little more 70s. Should I dedicate a video exclusively to Only Murders in the Building? Comment below if you'd love to see that. Maybe when season three comes out, I think that might be fun. Maybe I'll have gotten my hands on some Rare Beauty by then. Are you listening, Rare Beauty PR team? I want fancy earrings. Speaking of Camille, you ruined her for no good reason. We said Emily sucks. We hate her. Y'all heard, let's make Camille a terrible person so that we just like Emily more by default. You all suck at your jobs. Dear show writers, we weren't even asking for a lot here. It's great that you put on a mindless show that I could just keep on in the background while I sat on the couch and edited my YouTube videos and could just occasionally glance up and still know exactly what was going on at any given time. Yes. 
I love fun, silly, mindless, easily digestible shows. I get the appeal of Emily in Paris for this reason too. Your job is not hard, so why'd you have to go and make us angry by completely ruining Camille? If you did show any growth at all, you completely went backwards with Camille's character and it doesn't make any sense. We loved her and you made us not like her instead of just working on Emily and trying to just make her a better person, have her go through struggles like being unemployed, which you decided to make not a struggle at all, or the idea of how the central theme this season was not choosing is making a choice, but then we go the whole season and you still have Emily not make a choice. I just... <sighs> Friendly Space Ninja gets into depth about this, so I highly, highly recommend you watch his video on Emily in Paris season three. It is amazing. Again, I refuse to spend way too much time on this, so enjoy the supplemental viewing after this. If you're interested in learning more or, you know, having your own opinions about the show further validated. Also, can we talk about Savoir for a sec? Not only is Emily just bad at her job and just gets really super lucky all the time, the concept of people matching their pets is really uninspired. 101 Dalmatians came out in 1961. And the only reason the cat filter gag is funny is because it actually happened and we all collectively remembered cat filter lawyer guy on Zoom. Mr. Ponton, I believe you have a filter turned on in the video settings. Uh, you might want to uh, uh, take, take We're a trying look. to, we're tr can you hear me, Judge? I can hear you. I think it's a filter. It, the, it is, and I don't know how to remove it. I'm here live. It's not, I'm not a cat. Why is it always the same core people working on the marketing campaigns? Why aren't different people assigned different campaigns? What does everyone else in that office do? Here's four actors, and the rest of the office is just background actors who I guess have no actual jobs. Who are all those people in the office? And who then are all those people taking up space in Sylvie's home? Why are they there? We never know. This isn't even how jobs work. Like there's way too much luck in Emily's favor and not a lot of struggle or failure. Not enough to make it believable. Actually, here's a great example of being both lucky and a failure as Don pitched a bunch of really bad ideas to the client while completely drunk, but they still liked the bad idea. So Sterling Cooper still ended up with the account. So I will give Emily credit for not being a messy alcoholic, I guess, but not drinking on the job is a pretty low bar. I mean, look at the whole McLaren situation on Emily in Paris compared Let's to say the Honda situation on Mad Men. So the original event space that was planned for this big McLaren event is no longer available, but then Emily just happens to get texted a pic of this castle. Thanks Alfie and your new job. A literal castle with fields of lavender to host this big event for McLaren in to promote their new color, which is not lavender. That is not lavender. They might as well have just had it in a vineyard because it's great. It's like the grape soda McLaren, but I guess it doesn't sound as fancy, but that's what it is. It really, it killed me. I struggled to get through that episode because people kept calling grape lavender and that is clearly not what that is. The event turns out to be a huge success. And even within that whole event, Emily manages to solve another problem for another brand in the process. Meanwhile, in the episode title, oh no, this is so off here. Whoops, what did I do? Meanwhile, in the episode titled The Chrysanthemum and the Sword, the folks at Sterling Cooper Draper Price try to battle it out with their rival ad agency, CGC, to obtain Honda as their new client. This episode is so involved and has many different layers and so many people have varying opinions on this acquisition. And then you have things like Bertram Cooper, Bertie himself wanting to participate because of his expertise in Japanese culture. And then you have people like Roger Sterling who lost friends during World War II and absolutely refuses to do any business with the Japanese at all. Roger is who ultimately sabotages the meeting with the Honda representatives. But Don, who really wanted Honda as a new client, still managed to earn still managed to earn his agency an opportunity to market Honda's line of upcoming automobiles. He never won the account through luck per se, like Emily tends to go about things, relying on pure luck, 
but rather through scheming kind of through contriving <laughs> this crazy plan that involved tricking the other ad agency to cheat and then withdrawing himself from this competition that Sterling Cooper Draper Price was having with CGC thereby making him look more honorable and therefore better and winning Honda's respect and admiration that way it was a lot of episode but it was a lot of good episode there was sake involved oh you want to talk about trauma bangs this episode even one-ups Emily's trauma bang because in this episode Sally cuts her own hair to look pretty shout out to Wikipedia because I was not gonna remember this entire episode on my own it has been literal years I think the closest we get on Emily in Paris to somebody concocting some great scheme that ultimately works in their favor is Sylvie getting Emily and Madeline kicked out the old Savoie building by getting cozy with the building manager. I also want to talk about the fact that Emily in Paris still after three seasons has no notable black women characters. Now granted Mad Men wouldn't introduce us to Dawn Chambers until season five but even then she was a recurring character. She was there from season five through to the end. 22 episodes across three seasons. And that show was set in New York in the 1960s. We weren't looking for progressivism there. What's Emily in Paris's excuse? Why can't I talk or think anymore? What makes this exclusion even that much more egregious is that Dior just unveiled at the time of me taping this, their spring summer 2023 couture show, which was directly inspired by Josephine Baker. So it feels that much weirder that a show set in Paris sort of celebrating Parisian designers and Parisian culture and Parisian fashion and even some Parisian icons like uh, Brigitte Bardot via Emily's personal style here and there that the writers on Emily in Paris never thought to create a black or mixed race woman character and do the same thing. The walls on the show featured other notable black icons like Eartha Kitt, who herself became fluent in French from her time performing in Europe, and Nina Simone, who left the US in protest, settled in France, and remained there until her death. Everyone knows that cover of Nemkit the Ba. Honestly, for all of these scenes where you have Mindy singing in a nightclub, it's weird that we never see the act that comes before or after Having her. Having one of your new main filming locations be this nightclub Mindy performs at could have been a great opportunity to introduce a Nina Simone type character. A fabulous black female vocalist that took the stage before or after Mindy and befriended Mindy through something like, I don't know, meeting backstage and learning that they had to share a dressing room and having a friendship evolve from there. But no. I feel like it was just such a missed opportunity. Or even a Josephine Baker. I mean, surely French people want to hear other French people perform French music and not Mindy performing Dua Lipa. Oh, I love the shallow performance, but I'm biased because I walked down the aisle to that song. That is my mic cord. Please don't play with that. Also, one last note on Mad Men. For all of the very valid criticisms that Parisians or French people have made on the show about the stereotype of Cheating. Mad Men was full of serial cheaters, so <laughs> we do it here too. It's not that it's an excuse to depict it, but we depict ourselves doing it all the time. I think the show needs to be very careful about continuing on without showing any demonstrable growth amongst its characters. I don't think that the character of Sylvie alone can keep carrying the show the way she did this season. She must be exhausted after all of that. I am someone that has always loved reading YA. I will read YA novels until I die. <laughs> but the older I get, the more interest I take in other genres. Like, you know, new adult. I love new adult books because I still love stories about vampires and werewolves and witches as much as anyone else. A good enemies to lovers trope? Sure, sign me but up. But now I wanna read about the witches and vampires and werewolves that are in their 30s. That are graduate students that go to yoga class and drink nice wines and complain about being tired all the time. I wanna feel like the content that I love has grown up with I'm me. I'm also reminded of the countless 
other YouTube essayists, commentary channels, drama channels, etc., that have covered the subject of other YouTubers disappearing off the platform and becoming irrelevant because they got stuck making the same content over and over and didn't grow up with their audience. So as much as we will always love mindless television, I think it's also fair to be wary that if you do not grow, your audience will outgrow you. You can't help but feel that after three seasons, that's where I'm at with the show right now. I think I've given it a chance. I haven't seen it get much better. I think season two got better, but season three felt like a regression. And so I wanna move on to something just as fancy and pretty and colorful, but where the writers actually care about the writing and about telling great stories. I'm not feeling that so much. Again, aside from Sylvie's arc throughout this season. Sylvie continues to slay and we are forever grateful but I need more. And these might be famous last words because who's to say I won't totally forget the sentiment and get excited or not to watch season four. Though I don't think excited is the right word. It's more like the time season four comes around, I'm sure I'll need something else to play in the background while I edit my YouTube videos. And I think there's something to be said for the fact that I don't need to fully pay attention when Emily in Paris is on screen because there's better content out there occupying my time and I'm the one making it. Every creator I've seen cover the topic of the show has had a slightly overlapping, but still widely varied taste. I hope you took something new away from this video as well. Anyway, I'm sure I had more to say, but future me might follow up with additional context if she feels so inclined. If you're like me and you're finding yourself in need of a fashion palette cleanser, feel free to check out this video next. I'll meet you over there. And so will Colton. Bye. And so will Colton. Flat, flat, flat.